together. And it was in the power of relational ministry that God began to move and work in the hearts and lives of individuals. And as he did that, it was the genesis, the, the power behind the explosive growth that took place in the church in the first century. Now, what we're learning from the third world countries today in the area of church growth is this. Where churches choose to work together, where the people in the church take responsibility for the work of God in their particular place, where folks say, we're going to come alongside our pastors, our shepherds, and serve with them, God is doing some absolutely amazing things. South America, Africa, the Middle East, believe it or not, the, the Far East, uh, throughout the Asia-Pacific region, where people are working together and focusing on relational ministry, Acts chapter 2, like things are happening. I don't believe this morning that that is something that is just reserved for those parts of the world. I believe that what God is doing in those parts of the world, he wants to do in a mission area called the USA Canada. I believe what God is doing as he is literally coming on the scene and churches are exploding with growth, I, I believe he wants to do that here. Case in point, uh, here about almost six months ago now, we sent Daryl and, and Sherry Riffle out to Larnard, Kansas. Uh, they started their first Sunday with 12 people. Uh, this last week, they had a revival Sunday over Wednesday. Uh, they had anywhere from 40 to 55, 56 people in attendance every night. Uh, God worked miracles in people's lives. They gained six new families to their church this week. And it was interesting, as Daryl was telling me this, the one thing that kept coming out of what he was saying is, Pastor, we're just all working together. And I heard those words, and I thought about this morning. And what happens when a people in a church make the decision to work together, to build his kingdom in the power of relational ministry. If you have your Bibles, turn with me this morning to Acts chapter 2. Uh, we're going to take a look at those verses of scriptures we've been studying now for seven weeks. Acts chapter 2, uh, verses 42 to 47. I want to read this morning uh, to you from the New American Standard. They're going to be on the screen. You've also got them in your own Bibles. But hear the word of the Lord this morning. Uh, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who believed were together and had all things in common and they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with, us, with all as anyone might have a need. And day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Look at those words, especially verse 46. Day by day. Continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread together from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. There was a contagious spirit of togetherness in the early church. These folks liked each other. They enjoyed being with one another. They found ways to put aside their differences. They found ways to, 
to deal with everyone's idiosyncrasies. They laid all of those preconceptions and those thoughts and those feelings aside, and they said, this is a bigger thing than all of that. God's called us together to be his body, the church. And whether it's through worship or through fellowship or in prayer or in any other manner, what has to happen is we have to be together. And in that spirit of togetherness, God did some absolutely amazing things. Now, in the previous six messages I've shared with you, we've looked at six different blueprints of what God was doing. Ways that in a spirit of togetherness, the church began to build and become all that God wanted it to be. We talked about the fact that the church needed to live in the power and in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We, we've talked about the fact that the church needs to be a place that worships the Lord first and foremost over everything else. We've talked about the fact that the church needs to be committed to discipleship, that it needs to celebrate who we are in a spirit of fellowship and unity where we are one. We've talked about the fact that the church is transformed through prayer and is to be a place of radical generosity. And in that spirit of togetherness, we've realized over the last six weeks that God was doing some amazing things. And all that he was doing finds its, its fulfillment in this seventh blueprint, I believe, where today we talk about the church being a place of togetherness, reflecting the power of relational ministry. Notice with me once again, Acts chapter 2, verse 46. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. There is something in those words that I think we in the church today need to get a hold of. The church was not designed to be a place that got together on Sunday and went its own separate ways the rest of the week. The church from its inception was designed to be a place where we do life together. That whether it be in worship on Sunday or in a restaurant on Monday, wherever we find ourselves through the course of the week, we share in a spirit of unity and togetherness, and God uses that to build his kingdom. Now, I want you to notice something. If you look at the ministry of Jesus, although he was often found ministering to the masses, to large groups of people, he reserved his most intimate teachings for a small core group of people. First there were 12, and then he boiled that group down to three, and then he boiled that group down to one, John the Beloved, and he poured himself into those 12 people in a manner that was absolutely unbelievable. Everything he did was designed to develop them, to help them grow in their discipleship and walk with him, to prepare them to be deployed as ministers of the kingdom in the world. Everything Jesus did was designed to work in a spirit of togetherness, celebrating the power of relational ministry. Here at Salina First, we have always had and have been throughout our history a church that, that shared the standard of this kind of small group ministry. We've called it Sunday school. 
and, and throughout our 80-some year history, we have been a part of a denominational movement that has said we grow best not in a large corporate gathering, but in a smaller intimate gathering, a core gathering, where we can ask questions, where we can talk about insights, where we can learn and understand theology and scripture, where we can be nurtured in our faith. For us, Sunday school has always been effective. We've used it well. But what if this morning God wanted us to take an intentional step beyond Sunday school? What if this morning God wanted us to move into a focused small group ministry where through careful group instruction and and relationships, we not only were enabled to grow in our faith, but also engage in a really powerful way to bring others to the faith through our relationships with them? What if... In addition to Sunday school, we were to follow the specific teaching we see in Acts chapter 2, verse 46, and made it our purpose to not only focus on growth opportunities in the temple, the sanctuary in the Sunday school, but to take the next intentional step where daily we met together and broke bread together, going from house to house, sharing in a spirit of togetherness in the power of this relational ministry. What if we chose to move outside of the church walls and to meet in small groups in our home? Not for the purpose of gossip or storytelling, but rather with intention to study the word, to grow in our faith, to reach out to our friends and neighbors by inviting them to be a part of those small groups that we're a part of. What if, this morning, we launched a new ministry that's called something like Real? groups, a ministry built on relationships, a ministry that focuses on enthusiastic discipleship, a ministry that emphasizes accountability for intentional spiritual living, a ministry that is centered on life application where we intersect faith with everyday life. What would happen if we said, along with worship and and along with Sunday school, we were going to be intentional about developing a new small group ministry where you and I could grow in our faith, where we could ask questions where we could gain new insight and understanding and in a very non-threatening way where we could invite others to come in with their questions and their doubts and find freedom to ask and to inquire in that kind of a relational place. What would happen if we said, it's good to come together in the ministry of the temple, the church, but it's also really good to take it house to house and to recognize that God wants us to work together. What would something like that look like? How in the world would it be developed? Well, let's take a look this morning. And let me walk you through that acrostic of the word real and catch a glimpse of what I believe God is, is calling us to as a local church. We, we begin with this thought, R for relationships. Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 20 
Jesus, you'll remember, has just come through his time of testing in the wilderness. He's been baptized and now has gone out to be tempted of the devil. He has defeated the devil and now is beginning his public ministry. And on the very front end of his public ministry, he starts reaching not to the masses, but to a small group of individuals who he's calling into relationship with him. Matthew chapter 4 Uh, Beginning at verse 18, we read, Now as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately, verse 20, they left their nets, and they followed him. Uh, Going on from there, Jesus saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. It wasn't enough on that day to be a part of a crowd. Jesus sought to build an inner circle, a group of followers he could disciple, a group of followers he could develop, a group of followers he could then release or deploy into the world to do kingdom ministry on his behalf. What was at the heart of that call was something called relationship, togetherness. It wasn't enough that they were followers from a distance or seekers who stood listening from afar. It wasn't enough that they were folks who just came on Sunday and sat in a pew. He was looking for an intentionality, a desire to engage, a relationship to be a part of. And he called them. And they stepped out of their world into his and became a part of something absolutely amazing. When the church practices what Jesus modeled in developing relationships, two things always happen. First of all, faith is reproduced, that's evangelism. People have the opportunity to come in, ask questions, find answers, and give their hearts to the Lord. That's evangelism. But they also grow in their relationship with Christ. That's discipleship. And if we understand anything, we understand that those are the two things that the church is supposed to be about. Evangelism reaching the lost, and discipleship, growing up the found. And that's the purpose of real group ministry. Let's take a look secondly at the the letter E, E for enthusiastic discipleship. Uh, Look for a moment with me at Matthew chapter 4 verse 20. And verse 22, you remember that Jesus has said, well, I want you to come and follow. And verse 20 says, immediately, Peter and Andrew immediately left their nets and followed him, for they were fishermen. Verse 22, James and John, sons of Zebedee, immediately left the boat and their father And followed him. Obviously there was something they saw. Something they heard. Something they understood. Something that attracted them to respond to this Galilean teacher. And I would suggest this morning that what it was. Was the way Jesus lived his life. He was enthusiastic. He was excited. 
He didn't have some kind of ho-hum religion where he just had this this blank stare on his face and this kind of forlorn look that said, I'm so holy, just ask me how holy I am. Instead, he was excited about life. He, He recognized the potentials and the possibilities of what God could do with a life wholly yielded to him. And that vibrancy, that enthusiasm became something that attracted these people. Why would you leave your profession? Why would you walk away from your father and the family business? Why would you step out to follow a Galilean preacher unless there was something about him that grew you? I'm convinced the church thrives in a spirit of enthusiasm. You've been in churches that didn't have enthusiasm, haven't you? Or it was just kind of dull and dead and lifeless and made you feel like you'd gone to a funeral instead of the house of the Lord. You've been there. So have I. Sometimes, to be honest, I kind of feel like that around here. But I don't think that's what God's looking for. He's looking for an enthusiastic discipleship that says, I'm so glad that Jesus has changed me. Jesus wasn't caught up in a stuffy or staid churchmanship. He wasn't one of those holier-than-thou kind of people who looked down their nose at everybody. He engaged people. He enthusiastically welcomed them and drew them in. And what we see most is that he was alive and lived life enthusiastically in the way he presented and reflected faith was contagious. People wanted what he had to offer. What about you and me? Do folks want what you and I have? Or when they see us coming, do they quickly move out of the way? How do they respond? I'm not talking today about some kind of giddy, goofy, almost slapstick kind of faith where you just kind of laugh and carry on all the time, but rather I'm looking for a faith, an enthusiastic faith that celebrates what Christ has done in you and offers the same grace that changed you to others knowing that he can do for them what he's done in you. Now that can happen in a corporate worship setting. And it often does. But the reality is more often than not for enthusiasm to be attractional it has to start in a smaller group environment where people feel comfortable to risk being real with one another. People want something that makes a difference in their life today. I'm convinced of that. I don't want to be political this morning, but if we would be a student of culture in this crazy political presidential race. Do you know what's attracting people to the candidates out front? Doesn't matter who they are. Do you know what's attracting them? They're enthusiastic. And they're offering something to the world, at least in words, whether they could ever deliver, who knows, and God hope they won't in some situations. But that enthusiasm and the thought that it could be different, 
is attracting people. And I would suggest this morning that ought to be what happens in the life and ministry of the church. Well, let's take a look this morning now at the letter A. A for accountability for intentional spiritual living. Accountability demands truth and integrity. Something the world that we live in today is very short on. This whole concept of accountability lies at the heart of a small group ministry environment. You see, it's hard to have intentional accountability in a corporate setting. You and I can hide all kinds of stuff here, and, and no one will know. And some of the most despicable people who have committed some of the most horrible crimes have hid a lifetime in the church and never been found out. Because in a corporate sense, personal accountability is pretty hard. But when you bring that down to a core group, you can start asking tough questions. Jesus always expected accountability from his followers. And he called them out when their actions or their attitudes reflected something other than what he was teaching. Do you remember the story of the two disciples? Conversing about who would wind up at the right and at the left hand of Christ when he established his kingdom and his throne. Jesus came to them. And he said, you know what? Real faith looks for servants. Not people jockeying for position at an eternal throne. Do you remember the day Jesus stepped into the temple and seeing all of the buying and selling that was going on, the word says he overturned the tables of the money changers and physically drove them out, screaming at the top of his lungs, my father's house was meant to be a house of prayer, but you have made it into a den of thieves and robbers. Jesus was about the business of holding people accountable. He was then, and he still does today, and so does the church. Do you remember Acts chapter 5 and the story of Ananias and Sapphira? It's one of the most powerful pictures of accountability you will find anywhere in Scripture. Now, let me, let me give you a little picture of what's going on. Verses 44 and 45 of Acts chapter 2 set the stage for the, the dynamic of what was happening. There we read that people began selling their possessions and, and giving to any who had need. We fast forward to chapter 5, and there's this phenomena going on where people are literally divesting themselves of anything and everything that they have, saying we want to be a part of a movement that works together to help one another. And I might add this morning... If the church could understand that in today's culture, we could put out all the self social welfare pro programs in the nation. If the church did what it was called to do, what it did in the first century, we wouldn't have to worry about social welfare in our nation because the church would care for people in ways that I believe God wanted the church to care. But along comes this man named Ananias and Sapphira, and Acts chapter 5 tells their story. They sold a piece of property, and having sold that piece of property, they made the decision that they were going to bring some, not all, of the proceeds and lay them at the apostles' feet for distribution for the needs of the church. Now on the front end, I want you to hear what they did was good. They didn't do anything wrong. 
in making a decision in that process that, you know, we probably need to little hold a little out for ourselves. Where they went wrong was to lie to the Lord and to the church and say, we held nothing back. We gave it all to the church. Now, now folks, hear me. I don't think their sin was holding something back. I think if they just would have come to the leaders and said, you know, we sold a piece of property and, and here is some of the proceeds and, and we, we intentionally held some back because we're concerned about our own needs and, and you know, we probably still have some growth to, to, to go through so that we can learn to trust a little better, but, but, but this is what we can feel we can do right now and, and we hope that's okay. I, I think if they'd have done that, there would have been no problems. Life would have gone on. But the word says in Acts chapter 5, when asked by the apostles, is this the price, the whole price you gained from the sale of your property? And Ananias said, yes, it is. The next statement is telling Because it tells us the power of accountability. Why have you lied to God? Why would you do that? Now now the story gets real interesting because Ananias dropped dead right there. That's accountability, folks. I don't know if God struck him or his own guilt struck him, but he dropped dead right there. His wife comes in a little later and she's asked the same question. And she follows in the same lie. Now I'm going to suggest to you she could have said, you know, it wasn't really the whole price. My husband and I just decided to hold a little back. And, 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 and we're giving a lot of it, but, but not all of it. I think Sapphira would have walked out of the temple that day in good shape. But she joined in the lie. And accountability happened. And the word says, those who carried your husband out are here now to carry you. And she dies. Now, I'm not going to suggest this morning that if you're living in sin today and trying to hide it and you face accountability, God's going to strike you dead on the spot. Poof, you're done. Greasy spot on the pavement. Not going to suggest that. But I am going to say this morning that God still expects us to stand for truth and integrity and righteousness and holiness. And the Holy Spirit will convict your heart and mine and point out any places where we fail in those areas. And ours is to respond. Now, how in the world does that work in a small group ministry? Well, we're accountable first to God and then to each other in the lives that we live. And when we fail in areas of truth and, and, and integrity, the consequences are egregious. They're horrible. But in a small group environment, people can find forgiveness and healing And make changes and deal with the things that need to be dealt with. For the world in which we are living expects us to be real. To live lives that reflect Christ in all things. To offer something different than what the world has to give. And that only happens when as a part of living out our faith, we hold one another accountable. Well, let's take a look at the last letter, the letter L, for life application where we intersect faith with our everyday lives. You know, in the first century, for those believers, faith intersected life every moment of every day, and they found ready life application for the teachings of the word 
and daily instruction in discipleship. They were looking to live it out. Look back once again at, at Acts chapter 2, verse 46. It, it says there that they made faith a priority. And what made that possible was the fact that they saw how the teachings of God's word fit into their everyday lives. And because life application was so evident, they found the ability to live the faith and share the faith with incredible passion. Which brings me to this truth. When it's worth sharing, and when people see the difference it makes in you, they want what you have. And I would suggest to you this morning that that kind of life application and response happens best, not in a corporate environment, but in a small group arena where folks like you and me can sit down and ask hard questions and find ways to apply the truths that we're learning. My responsibility as your pastor and the responsibility of your Sunday school teachers and Bible study leaders is not to do life application for you. Our responsibility is to present you with information, opportunities for growth. Your responsibility is to take that and do something with it. A part of real group ministry is, is a philosophy, a design philosophy, where we're going to begin with what's called sermon-based small group ministry, where we take the sermons that are preached, we write a curriculum from them, where you and I can ask questions of the things we've heard and studied in the Word, and where we can dialogue and look for life application of everything that we're learning. I wish that could happen in Sunday morning in a church. I wish instead of leaving here on Sunday morning and going to Sunday school, I could just pull a stool up and say, okay, what are your questions? Let's just dialogue for a while. But you know as well as I do, that won't work in a large group environment. People aren't comfortable. Folks will think my question's stupid. I'm too embarrassed to even ask it. But you get into a small group environment where you have the opportunity to wrestle with life application in God's Word, and amazing things can happen. Growth can take place. Real group ministry. It's relational, it's enthusiastic, it's accountable focuses on life application, it's coming to First Church. And my prayer is that when it comes, probably in a month or two, and you have opportunities to engage and dive in, my prayer is that you'll say yes. Sign me up. Count me in. My hope is that you'll cause your pastoral staff to panic because we're dreaming in one area saying we need this many host homes and this many group leaders, and, and, and as we fill those, we, we want to make sure that we're ready, but I'd love to have so many people say, count me in, that we quickly have to go back to the drawing board and figure out where the other group leaders and host homes are going to come from because the reality is this. God has called you and I, day by day, to continue with one mind in the temple, in the church, and taking our faith to the streets, to break bread together from house to house, sharing our meals with gladness and sincerity of heart, growing 
in grace together. Are you interested? Is it something you'd like to be a part of? When the stage is set, let me invite you to plug in. Pastor James is going to come and close our service in a word of prayer today. Thanks for worshiping with us this morning. I invite you to enjoy Sunday school and come back tonight as we worship once again at 6 o'clock. Yeah.